Indonesia dengan ini menyatakan kemerdekaan Indonesia. So bear in mind, this was the first eruption of anti-colonial self-rule ahead of India and into China and all the other places. And the imperial countries were new to it. They didn't know exactly what to do about it. The Federal Secretary of the Siemens Union, on behalf of the trade union movement of Australia, I present to you this flag. Take it with you to your young republic as a symbol of the support of the Australian workers in your fight for independence. Uh, yeah. Now the fight was really on. Wharfies walked off ship after ship. In Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide, Sydney. In all the ports of Australia. They said to the Dutch, we'll load ships for Indonesia any time if we get a guarantee that the cargo isn't arms or supplies that could be used against the Indonesian people. We never got that guarantee. I was in college. I was a tutor and I was having a cup of tea with my colleagues in the common room, and Mac Ball comes up to me and said, I hear you did a thesis on the Dutch East Indies. I've been invited to lead a mission to the Dutch East Indies. Would you be interested to come along? And I said, jumped at it. I said, yes, of course, I'd be delighted. And within a week, I was off. It took us several days to get there, you see. You know, first hop from Sydney to Brisbane, Brisbane to Cape York, and from there to Morotai, and Morotai to Labuan, where we spent two beautiful days on the beach, and then to Singapore, and Singapore to, to, to Batavia. And the last lap was in the little bomber. Well, it's going into the unknown in a sense. One knew the geography, but there's another thing about the circumstances of the country having had Japanese occupation for four or five years. We arrived in, in Batavia. We were met by a British officer who took us to the hotel, Hotel de Gallery or some such. And of course, Mac Ball was very discomforted. He said, no, no, this is not good enough. We'll have to move to some better quarters. So I had the good fortune of, of being put into this enormous bedroom in this former palace of the governor of West Java. Marble floors and chandeliers that didn't work anywhere. Plumbing that didn't work. But with a marvelous kitchen staff, we had excellent food there, the VIP mess, you see. I remember a shoebox full of Japanese-Indonesian currency. Why? The locals wouldn't accept. I had sterling, I had uh, Australian dollars and American dollars. Uh, just in case. They wouldn't take any foreign currency. And so we went to one of the best Chinese restaurants that night, loaded with this money, which one spent very freely because it was given to us for nothing. I don't know whether that, that was ever accounted for in the, in, in the budget of the, of the army, but they had stacks of it. And we established a routine. One of the first things was to be briefed by the Lieutenant General who was in charge. His job as he saw it, was to get rid of the Japanese prisoners of war, get the Dutch in, and buzz off, as he did in the end. And he wanted that to go as smoothly as possible. Van Moek had arrived. He was the governor general of the whole area. He occupied the residence across from where we were. He, we were told that Australians weren't welcome in the eyes of the Dutch there, who were interlopers, we had nothing really to do. They were dealing with the British. Mac was, you know, he's a prima donna. You know, he was representing the Australian government and he wasn't going to be pushed around, you know, not an underling. And as a matter of protocol, he says, I would like to see Sukarno and his, and his group. And nobody had done that before, you see. And I rang Sukarno's staff and I said, will you be able to give us Escort, safe escort. And they were very anxious to help. And soon after, 
This man came in his car and we followed his car. Mac Ball didn't trust my driving for some strange reason, but I said, look, as a matter of protocol, it's terribly important for you to be seated there and not driving the car. So I drove and followed the Indonesian car ahead of us and then presented ourselves at the steps of the house. And this very handsome man came out to greet Mac. I followed and got his hand as well. He was very impressive. Uh, there was charm and confidence. And he was a handsome man. He was well-dressed and, you know, real poise and in command of the situation. And then we were introduced to the rest of the cabinet. Hatta was there, Sharif Houdin, Shahrir, Subarjo was a foreign affairs man. And Sukarno, he did most of the talking. The man who would pitch in, perhaps his English wasn't as good as Hatta. And uh, Shahrir, Shahrir's English was very good. I think he might have been appointed prime minister about that time. So he was the spokesman and you wondered how a gentle, softly spoken person like that could be a, the prime minister of a country, a rebellious country. And Sukarno, of course, was the man holding the horse, speaking to Mac Ball and Mac explaining our presence there. And the Australian government is very anxious to know more about what is going on here. We're also offering any help that we can give you uh, by way of medical supplies or any other help that you might wish for us to consider. And the impression that Mac gave was that we were sympathetic to their cause. It was all very easy. I don't recall any tension or any embarrassment, anything like that. They made us so comfortable. You know, the Javanese are so polite. The Australians were the first to make formal contact with Sukarno and his, and his cabinet. And that's why we had this royal treatment. They were very anxious for the rest of the world to recognize them. After all, this was a self-proclaimed republic. It didn't have the imprimatur, the, uh, the acceptance, the endorsement of any other country in the world. I don't think Van Moek, the governor general, had met any of them at that stage. He was specifically told by his principals in Holland to stay away from the Quislings. They were the people who had collaborated with the Japanese. It was really a silly idea. I mean, after all, it was their country as much as the Dutch. And they were occupied, and the best they could do was to get as much as possible from the Japanese. And the Japanese left them alone, by and large. And they ran the public services, the trams and the trains and the buses and the postal telephone. Everything was functioning under Indonesian charge for the Dutch to think that they could come back and assume that nothing had changed, that they could simply pick up where they left off, I thought was absurd. And that was sort of a feeling that one got from the British representatives who came back. They'd been there before. The American had been there before. You know, they were coming back to their offices as if nothing had happened. And when that first military action took place, where the Dutch decided, despite the Lingajati agreement, to institute military action against the Indonesia, very successfully, the Australian government referred the matter to the United Nations and, and showed its displeasure at the action of the Dutch. Now, I say this is important because it's forgotten. The new generations don't know anything about Australia's role there. Uh, neither do the Australians, nor the Indonesians. It was more after the event that I began to ruminate and say, well, that was a wonderful experience, historic. It became more historic as time went on. Uh -huh.